Montevallo, I have to tell you right out of the gate, is the most forgiving college campus in America. First of all, we alums call Montevallo the Harvard of Shelby County. But Montevallo is incredibly forgiving because only at the University of Montevallo can you barely graduate. I mean a 2.6 GPA in mass communication, okay? And yet they still give you an Alumni Achievement Award 15 years later. Only at Montevallo, as a member of the intercollegiate golf team, can you shoot a 91 in your final round of competition representing the school, and yet they still put you in the School Sports Hall of Fame. That is a loving and forgiving campus at the University of Montevallo, and as I said, the night they put me in, you didn't, you didn't put me in this because of my athletic achievement and you really didn't give me that award for my academic achievement. It was in spite of what I did at Montevallo <laughs> that I'm here and that you recognize me. Um, I don't think you have me here today because of the very nice introduction that Tommy gave me, but I'm very grateful that I can be here. It's neat to be with you. Uh, two days ago, I had the honor of being with Coach Saban at a Boy Scouts event in Jasper. And the way Coach likes to do, not all of his speeches, but when he gets the option, when, when he gets to kind of dictate the terms, which is almost every time he does something, uh, the way he wanted to do it was to come up, but to have kind of a town hall meeting. He didn't just want to give a speech to a group. He wanted to have a talk, town hall type of deal. So I was brought in and, um, to basically facilitate that with him. And people ask me what it's like and I tell them I train with a bomb squad every summer. It's uh, you want to make sure you don't allow the explosives to go off and, and nobody gets injured in the, in the uh, disarmament of, of whatever's taking place. But he, came, he comes up, and we had not discussed this at all. I was given the format. Here's some, you know, here's your time frame on questions, and then coach wants to take some questions from the audience, and we've already determined who's going to ask them and what those questions are. I said, that's a wise move on your part. So I introduced coach, and it was far less elaborate than the very kind one that Tommy gave because that guy doesn't need an introduction, which is what I said. A man who needs no introduction, please welcome Nick Saban. He comes up on stage. I shake his hand. We, we go to this little table about similar to the height of this. We sit in these, with these chairs, and I think I'm supposed to start maybe saying hello, Coach. Before I can say hello, Coach says, great to be with all of you, and he goes into a, a wonderful little four to five minute basically mini speech or presentation and, and talks about why he was there and why he was pleased to be there to honor um, Steve Hudson, who was a man in the community who had uh, been very much involved in Boy Scouts and, and was receiving an award named for Larry Drummond, who had had such an impact in that community and, and elsewhere. And he goes, look, I'm, you know, I'm here because of an award name for Larry. I'm here and was friends with him. I'm here because of Steve. And he just shares a wonderful and some, some life lessons all in the span of about four or five minutes. It's fantastic. And he finishes that and then he turns and looks at me. I said, Coach, I grew up going to Methodist and Baptist churches as a child. I know you grew up Catholic. I said, where I grew up, I said, after that, we just say amen and go to the house. <laughs> And the room responded, as you did, and he waited for a second. He said, yeah, well, I grew up Catholic, so we got to sit here and feel guilty for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't stay an hour, but I knew I was just putting it on the tee for him the rest of the night. Forgive me if I, uh, if I seem a little casual, but if you don't mind, I'd rather just visit with you than give a speech. Um, 
driving over, I intentionally pulled up a song on my iPhone. Technology is amazing. Again, I grew up in Fairfield. I finished with a 2.6 in mass comm, which means I could maneuver my way around Radio Shack, and then they closed it, and so I can't do anything anymore <laughs> electronics related. But somehow I figured out this, this iPhone and Apple Watch thing, and y'all relax. I've set a timer, so I've got a pretty good idea of when to, if not shut up, at least when to start winding up and take some questions. But I pulled up a song that I wanted to hear. There's a, there's a contemporary Christian, I don't know if it's one singer, a group, called Big Daddy Weave. And the song is If I Told You My Story. And the whole refrain throughout the story is to tell you my story is to tell you of him. It's to tell you of God's mercy, God's grace, and what God has done in me, what God has done for me, that's the theme of the whole song. And I hope that's the theme of what I share with you today. It's not really my story because I didn't do anything. But God used a lot of people in a very, very special way to allow me to even be here with you today, let alone be able to wake up on my own, oh, with the help of the Apple Watch, to get in the car, to get in the shower, to get dressed, to get in the car, to drive here, to be able to stand here in front of you today. There are a lot of people a whole lot smarter than I am that say that shouldn't be the case. So here's my story as I hopefully tell of him. Almost four years ago, it was about, it was actually April 15th. Technically on the calendar, it transitioned to April 16th at midnight. I went to sleep. Typical day, I, typical weekend. I had just done a baseball series in College Station, Texas. We played Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Flew home after the game on Saturday. Sunday, I went to one of my Great niece's birthday parties, had a wonderful time, felt great, no issues, went to bed. My wife wakes up about 4.30 in the morning to check on our youngest child. He was seven at the time. She didn't have to go far to look for him. A little stinker crawled into bed with us in the middle of the night. She sees him laying there, but then she looks over and she sees me. I'm balled up in the fetal position. I'm twitching. I'm making some groaning noises. She thinks I'm having a bad dream. Tries to wake me. I don't respond. She realizes I've got a problem. She calls paramedics. Paramedics come, check me out. Vitals are fine. I always hesitate to tell this part because I don't want, to, want it to come across as a criticism, but it's really part of the story and fully believed that some incredible professionals made a mistake only because of God's design and God's plan. So I don't want anybody to hear what I'm about to say and feel like I'm criticizing some incredible people. Because I live in Hoover, I've lived in Hoover for most of my adult life. I'm very grateful for the community that I'm in and the, the people who serve to protect, defend, serve, and care as the people there do and in communities like yours, like mine, everywhere. But they are human and sometimes mistakes are made. And a mistake was made this night as the world sees it. I know it wasn't. It was God's design. It was God's plan when they convinced my wife that I had taken too much of a prescribed sleeping pill, Ambien. I take Ambien, I'd been taking it for probably two or three years. When I come in from doing a ball game, I might get in at midnight, I might get in at 2 a.m. And to unwind is not an easy thing. So the doctor 
my regular physician gave me a prescription for Ambien. I'd been taking it with no issues. One half to one pill. That's all I ever take. That's all I took that night was one half of a pill. But the paramedics, for whatever reason, were convinced that I had taken too much Ambien and convinced my wife that that was the case. They left my home. Two hours later, my wife wakes up to get ready to go to work, gets her shower, comes back. Not only am I still laying in the bed, balled up in the fetal position, I'm even less responsive than I was. She calls him back, says, I don't care what you say, you're taking him to the hospital. First hospital they wanted to take me to was to the freestanding ER on 150 in Hoover. But when they called, they were full. There was no room in the inn. He said, where now? He said, well, I guess St. Vincent's. That's where his primary care doctor is. So they take me to St. Vincent's. They're going through all of these tests and checking all of these things for me, all of my vital signs. And they're checking under the pretense that it's a drug overdose, which was not the case. But when I come into an ER, they only know what they're told by the first responders. So that's how they were treating it. That was their mistaken presumption. So they're running these tests, they're running these tests, they finally get a drug test back. There's not a trace of Ambien. There's not a trace of anything in my system. They run a CAT scan. Nothing's irregular. They run a second CAT scan. I had two clots on my brain. I'd had a stroke. Some of you, most of you are probably familiar with strokes, heard about them, experienced them somewhere in your family. You know a phrase that I've heard many times over the last four years. In a stroke situation, time is brain. And brain is life. I'd gone to bed at midnight. My wife didn't find me in an emergency state or a different state until 4.30 in the morning. Paramedics came. Paramedics <clears throat> left. Two more hours pass. They're called again. They've taken me to this hospital. They've run these tests. There's nothing that they find. They run more tests. They find that I've had a stroke. We're looking at around 10 a.m. at this point. So sometime, we'll say best case, 429 and 10 o'clock. Five and a half hours, if my Montevallo and Fairfield <laughs> math are correct. Five and a half hours. At best case scenario, potentially nine, nine and a half hours. I shouldn't have been alive, but I was. Now they've find, found out what's the problem. Now they got a bigger problem, time. And also, there's not a physician at St. Vincent's that could do what I needed done. He knew, though, the guy that was in charge of my case knew that there were two doctors in Birmingham who were specialists in treating what I had wrong. He called the one he had the most confidence in, and he was at Brookwood Hospital. His name was Jatendra Sharma. As we tend to say, he ain't from around here. <laughs> and no, Mickey, I know what you're thinking. He ain't from Selma either. Jay Sharma, as he prefers to be called, had had two surgeries on the books that morning. If they had called Jay Sharma at 5 o'clock in the morning, as they should have, 
when first responders first found me, Jay would have had to say, I can't take him, I've got surgery. What the world sees as a mistake was God's design for Jay Sharma to be my physician. Jay Sharma gets me in the ER, is able to bust the, the two clots, not easily. He would tell me that they had put the device in that's supposed to pull the clot out. He goes, Chris, you're, I had the device on its maximum setting it was working with the full amount of force it could possibly work. Your blood pressure was over 200. The clot wasn't budging. You were running out of time and there was no plan B. He said on one of the last attempts that in good conscience I could make without giving up, the clot suddenly cleared. Amen. I opened my eyes. <clears throat> I really wasn't pausing for dramatic effect. It's kind of emotional. I opened my eyes and I could see him in the operating room. Immediately they put me back under they put the stent in. I wake up two hours later. And I, I wear glasses, obviously. Didn't have my glasses on. And I see this man come into my room and I see my family hugging him. And I see this, this man from India, I would find out later, going, all God's blessing, all God's blessing. He said, the re they don't put you under when you've had a stroke because they want you to wake up. Because I asked him several weeks later, I said, Jay, this is going to sound crazy, but when you walked into my room after the procedure was over, I felt like I'd seen you before. He goes, oh yeah, you opened your eyes and look right at me. That's how we know that the clot's cleared. But we have to put you back asleep, put the stent in, take care of everything. So... The only ill effect that I suffered after just a few weeks, the only ill effect from that stroke, in which case I had the stroke somewhere between 12 midnight and 4.30 a.m. and did not have the clot cleared until almost noon that day. Anywhere from roughly 8 to 12 hours from when I had the stroke. The only ill effect that I had after the first couple of weeks or so the left eye muscle drooped. I had blurred vision, double, triple vision, without putting, in essence, scotch tape over my glasses. Or when I would wear contacts, I'd wear a patch over my left eye. Now y'all look at me. I'm not exactly physically intimidating or imposing. I don't strike fear in the heart of really anybody, just ask my kids. But when I put that patch on, boy, I felt like John Wayne. <laughs> it was about the only cool thing of that whole experience. That patch, my wife said it got annoying when I called everybody pilgrim for about six months, but you got to be my age or older to get that, but I'm glad most of you are. <laughs> but after 11 months, after 11 months, after being told for weeks and months and months leading up to this by different doctors, eye specialists at one of the best places in the world for that, Callahan Eye Foundation downtown. This one particular doctor who I could tell was not a believer in God, certainly not a believer in Jesus. Good man, good, 
good at his profession, very kind, but you could tell. One day I go in, and he's been telling me this whole time, you need to understand, this is going to be two and a half, three year process. But there's a very strong likelihood, even after two and a half, three years, you're never going to have your vision fully restored. You're never going to have it fully restored. You just need to prepare for that and understand this may be the new normal for you. Well, in the meantime, I'd gone back to work. This had happened in April. We got back. I was involved in football. With a patch over my eye, I could still see and function with my right eye. I could see fine. It wasn't quite the same, but it was close. Basketball season started. I was fine. I tried, I tried to go with just contacts and no patch. One game. And when John Petty shot a three at Coleman Coliseum from the right wing, and as I followed the flight of the ball, my eye muscle started to droop. And if, you're, if you've never had any issues with your vision, things that I've learned, not with my 2.6 GPA from Montevallo, but from talking to specialists, if your eyes are off, just a millimeter, just the slightest bit, your vision is off. It's a miracle that these two eyes work in sync the way they do to be able to see clearly and function. Something I took for granted. I never will again. Because as John Petty shot that three-pointer from the wing and I started watching it with just my regular contacts in and no patch over the eye, that ball took flight, but halfway to the basket, I saw three of them. I didn't see a three-point shot. I saw three basketballs. The top one went over the top of the basket. The bottom one hit the lane. It landed five feet short. The third one went right through the basket and the building went nuts. And I waited a split second longer than I normally do before saying, not emphatically, but with a question mark at the end, bottom? Thankfully, I got it right. Always follow the one in the middle if you see three. I learned that lesson. I put that patch back on before that ball went back into the front court. I knew that I didn't need to go without the training wheels. So I had the, the patch back on. But 11 months after my stroke, I'm back in that doctor's office. And I take the glasses off. And he takes the tape off this lens and he goes, let's, let's do the eye test. And I knew. I'd been waiting on this visit. I knew. I got every letter right in the correct order. He starts doing exam. He goes, huh, 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 huh. Wow. Well. And he took my glasses and he peeled the tape off of it. He handed me my glasses. And then he hands me that little circle of tape. And he hands that to me as well. He said, well, you can keep this if you want it, but you don't need it anymore. Your eyes healed. He said, I don't have an explanation. I said, that's okay, I do. Mm -hmm. And he kind of grinned. I said, I know you don't, but I do. That's 11 months. That was the last effect I had the last ill effect that I had from my stroke. Unless I messed something up and then I would use that with my wife anytime I needed to. <laughs> if I forgot something, if I, I did something wrong, well, you know, honey, I just had a stroke. Like, yeah, well, you can... <laughs> she goes, I have known you for a long time. This is not the stroke. 
that was March of 2019. Fast forward very quickly. In fact, I'll reset this to make sure that I go semi-fast forward. Fast forward to that summer, my friend Jay Sharma and I are at a social gathering together. Jay says, you look great. I'd lost about 10 pounds. He told me the stroke had nothing to do. In all my meetings with him and follow-ups with him, he told me all of my doctor's visits, Chris, your stroke was a fluke. You don't fit the profile. On the initial evaluation, he goes, do you drink? In the Methodist background, he said, Doc, I'll have a bottle of wine every week and a half. The Baptist part of me kept me from having a full two bottles. You know, but I said, you know, bottle every week and a half. He said, that doesn't count as drinking in terms of how it would affect your health. He said, do you smoke? I said, yes, sir. One cigar, once a year, every third Saturday in October <laughs> for 12 consecutive years. And as long as Nick Saban's coach in Alabama, that's going to continue to be the case. He said, that doesn't count as smoking by, from a medical standpoint either. He said, well, you're not what we term as overweight. He said, look, if you, want to, if you want to put yourself at ease, you want to put your mind at ease, you could drop five or 10 pounds. He said, but you're not overweight. That didn't cause this. Chris, it's a fluke. He said, it's a fluke that you had it. It's a miracle that you're alive. It's a miracle that you're standing here the way you are because all of these patients that I've had in my career, less than one hand, less than one hand, can I count the number of people that survive what you survived, let alone flourish at the level you flourish. So fast forward to this social gathering with him in late June, early July, I believe it was. It was early July. He goes, you look great. Well, I lost 10 pounds, 15 pounds, whatever it was. He says, you look fantastic. How you feel? I said, Jay, I feel great. And at this same social gathering, his nurse practitioner was there. She was part of my team that saved my life when I had the stroke. And I had shared a story with the nurse practitioner of how I felt. And when I told her this minor thing, she told me, you better tell Sharma. And if you don't tell him, I will. I said, okay. So when Jay Sharma walked over to where we were standing in that social gathering and says, you look great. How do you feel? And I looked at her, I looked at this woman, she raised her eyebrow at me the way Ann Stewart, my mama, used to raise her eyebrow. And I knew, you know, everybody talks about the pro wrestler, the rock, the actor. You know, he used to have this thing called the people's eyebrow, where he would look at you and he, I can't even do it, but he'd raise that eyebrow. They called it the people's eyebrow. That was the Ann Stewart eyebrow. I saw that for years, and it was far more intimidating from a five foot tall woman than The Rock ever delivered, okay? But this nurse practitioner that day in that setting is giving me the people's eyebrow, the Ann Stewart eyebrow. And she goes, you better tell him. And he goes, tell me what? I said, Jay, it's, it's, I really don't think it's anything. I said, I feel fine. Every now and then though, a little more frequently as of late, I'll feel a little tingling or a little tightness in my arm. He goes, where? And I showed him right through here. He goes, that's your heart. We got to get you in. EKG revealed that I needed a stress test. The doctor tells me, he said, hey, you're going to need, you're going to need a stress test. He said, I really think that there is the potential for it to be a false read and there's nothing wrong. I said, I know I had an EKG or excuse me, I had an arteriogram 10 years ago and it had a false read. That's what it turned out to be. He goes, it could be that again. 
But Chris, I really think we're going to probably need to put a stent in. He said, of course, there is the possibility. And I cut him off. I said, there's possibility of bypass surgery. He said, yeah, but I don't. I said, it's okay. I've got a history of my family. My father who died one year ago. Dad died one year ago. I was trying to remember if we'd switched to March yet or not, but it's still February. One, one year ago, my father died at the age of 91. But at the age of 70, my dad had bypass surgery. At the age of 45, when I was seven years old, my mother had bypass surgery for the first time. John Kirkland, the man who the clinic is named for, performed the surgery successfully. Incredibly fortunate. She did very well. Until 10 years later, she needed to have surgery again. Same physician, same hospital, same results on the surgery. A success. But as they are bringing her back down to the CICU after her surgery, her blood pressure suddenly dropped. They never got her heart started back. And my mother died when I was 17 years old and she was 55 years old. At one of the greatest medical facilities in the world with one of the world's best heart surgeons providing the surgery. It was the most difficult thing I'd ever dealt with in my life at the moment. But that was God's time. That was God's plan. But as I'm standing there telling this man, I understand about bypass surgery. He goes, but I don't think you're going to need that. For whatever reason, I did. So a week later, we went in. And they were supposed to put the stent in, and I remember through the haze of coming out of the anesthesia. Mr. Stewart, we're going to have to revisit this. The stent's not going to do the job. I was told that I had 95% blockage, but in just one artery. Now, just one artery. That's the artery known as the Widowmaker. That's like saying there's just one wreck on the interstate. But it's on I-65 at Malfunction Junction. It's at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. It's just one wreck, but it's the big one. So Jay Sharma, who saved my life with a stroke, would save my life in a social setting, in a casual conversation, because I had 95% blockage in the Widowmaker. If those incredible, well-trained, excellent professionals don't misdiagnose me where and as they did when I had the stroke, I never meet Jay Sharma, who then saved me from having a heart attack and dying, because I would have. It would have happened. Now. This is where the fun really started. This bypass surgery was a huge success. Had the surgery on a Monday morning. I went home on Friday. Felt so good, I went to church on Sunday. And I got to back up. Went to Green Valley Baptist Church the previous Sunday. The Sunday before, I'm scheduled to have surgery on Monday morning. The first song starts... My family and I are sitting basically on the front row. We're very close to it. Myself, my wife and I bookending our two boys. Biscuits are burning. Uh, the two boys. At the time, ages 14 and 8. They're sitting there, and when I start to tear up during this song, because songs will do that to me, music does that to me, as it does a lot of people. But as this song starts up and I start to feel the emotion, knowing what I'm going to face the next day, my 13, 14-year-old son sees me tearing up, and he starts to lose it. He's bawling. 
So I catch a break, to be honest. Because y'all know what it's like at church. You see somebody crying and go, uh oh, what they done? What they do wrong? And I just started loving on my child, and everybody thought he'd messed up instead of me. So it, it made me a little, a little better. But I had gone to church the previous Sunday. One week later, I'm back in that same seat at that same church. Let me fix this, Tommy. I didn't give myself another 30 minutes, so I'll make sure it's only three. Sunday to Sunday, I was able to be there after having bypass surgery. Felt great. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I had company. One of my best friends leaves my house 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. I remember David waving at me, saying goodbye, shutting the door. But I have no memory for the next month. Over the course of the next few days, I developed pneumonia, MRSA, sepsis, rhabdomyolysis. My liver, my kidneys, my lungs, pancreas, every organ started to shut down. A friend who's a physician said, Chris, I know half your medical team. And doctors, because of confidentiality, are not supposed to share, but we share. And he goes, their words to me were, you were as sick as you could possibly be without dying. I said, well, Doc, I got a history of carrying things too far, so I'm glad for once in my life I didn't. Amen. He said, Chris, you were sick. You were as sick as you could be. My wife called my best friends and said, you need to get here, or at what were our closest friends as a couple and said, you need to get here. He's not going to make it. I was in a coma for two weeks. I was in a hospital for 91 days. I walked out two days before, excuse me, I walked out the day before Thanksgiving. I remember watching the Iron Bowl. It was played at Auburn. Mac Jones' junior year, not his senior year where he throws that pass in the end zone just barely behind Najee Harris. And that Auburn linebacker takes it off his shoulder and goes 100 yards the other way. And I remember sitting in my den as that player from Auburn crossed the 50-yard line with not an Alabama guy in sight. And I turned to my wife and I said, Dear Lord, have I not been through enough? <laughs> And then I realized I was not going to have to take phone calls on a post-game show, and I was not going to have to deal with Coach Saban. So suddenly I could, I could handle it a little bit better. But I was home. I've been home ever since. Two and a half years removed from all of that taking place. What I tell you that I value and appreciate every day it's an understatement. I'll be honest. I don't value it and appreciate it every day like I should. But boy, do I appreciate it. Amen. So when a friend asks me, hey, will you come and visit? Come and share? Yeah, you bet I will. This is not my story but it's his. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. I've had several people tell me today, hey, it's good to see you. I prayed for you. Don't, you don't have to walk off. I promise I'm done. When I say that, no, you come by me because you're one of them. When I say that without your prayers, I wouldn't be here today, I don't say it lightly. I don't say it flippantly any more so than you say to me, hey, we prayed for you. Because I know without a shadow of a doubt, the only reason I'm able to be here and share with you, not my story, but his, is because of the prayers you offered up on my behalf. 
And please know on behalf of myself and my family how much it's appreciated. Thank you all and God bless you.